Walking is just another gear. On a 25% gradient like this, it might be the correct gear. How are your gears? If you're an endurance cyclist, there's a good chance they are way too high. In this video, we'll look at typical gearing on drop bar bikes, assess what gearing is best suited for most long distance cyclists, as well as your specific needs, and explore changes you can make to get the gearing that works best for you. Why is gearing the way it is? Well, racing. Mainstream bikes blend the needs of pro racers with the aspirations of consumers. Pro cyclists need to attack on mountain descents and sprint to 70 kilometers an hour. When climbing, their light bodies can push six watts per kilo for multiple mountains in a day. Their gearing needs will average much higher than a non-pro and be in another league compared to an endurance cyclist. According to a recent Road.cc article, the Trek Segafredo Pro Racing Team had settled on 52 39 tooth chainrings with a 10 33 tooth cassette for their standard setup. This gives 520% high and 118% low gear ratios. By comparison, my wife's new budget road bike came with 50 34 tooth chainrings and an 11 30 cassette with 455% high and 113% low ratios. Should her bike's lowest gear be about the same as Vincenzo Nibli's? No, and neither should yours. But long distance cyclists are probably buying endurance bikes. They have suitable handling, tire clearance, and fit range for our needs. They also have lower gearing. Modern endurance bike gearing comes with a compact 50 34 tooth crankset and usually an 11 to 34 tooth cassette which gives a one-to-one -one or 100% low gear ratio. Unfortunately, endurance cyclists like randonneurs are still overgeared. Normal folks doing normal cycling will love compact gearing, but a randonneur will ride a minimum of 200 self-supported kilometers on a brevet, with some courses lasting up to six days. Even the strongest randonneurs will struggle to produce the power needed to justify such high gearing. The riding style of a successful randonneur avoids power surges, carefully paces climbs, and rest or soft pedals on descents. This is to avoid needing extended recovery from hard efforts and to preserve energy. Because of this target riding style, we shouldn't be using high gears much and we badly need the low gears for effectively pacing climbs. As we learned in the video, why randonneurs should ride fast bikes, lower intensity, like during climbing, requires less contribution from carbohydrates and allows for more contribution from fat for energy during exercise. This reduces the chances for bonk and helps reduce fatiguing factors. So what is ideal gearing for a long distance cyclist? The answer is, of course, it depends. Typical climbing gradients on your courses and total system weight, which includes the rider, bike, carried equipment, food, and water, are two important considerations. The third is your BTP, or Brevet Threshold Power, a term I just made up. Like how FTP is analogous to your one hour sustainable power, BTP is the maximum power you can sustain in a somewhat steady state effort over a target Brevet distance. It's the power to target under most riding conditions on a Brevet for maximum pacing efficiency. For a general endurance use case, let's assume an imaginary rider that happens to be just like me. The total system weight is 100 kilograms and the brevet is a bit hilly with some steep pitches. The rider targets 150 watts BTP, but since climbs are an efficient time to increase power, our rider aims to climb at between 175 to 200 watts. Pedal and cadence under 70 RPM is uncomfortable. These limits can be exceeded, of course, but the more time and at greater intensity these limits are exceeded, the larger the debt that is incurred and must be paid back with break time, extra fueling, and maybe decreased future performance. Gearing determines how slow of a speed can comfortably be pedaled without going below a target cadence. Using 70 RPM as a lower limit 
Compact road gearing of a 34 tooth chainring and a 34 tooth cassette cog allows a 9 km per hour minimum speed. With a 30 tooth gravel chainring, this drops to 7.9 km per hour. Moving instead to a 40 tooth cassette cog, 7.6 km per hour is now comfortable. Using both the gravel chainring and large cassette, 6.75 km per hour is now possible, 25% slower than with compact gearing. Using the gribble.org calculator and estimating other variables, we can see our imaginary rider exceeds their target power and cadence limits above a 7.1% gradient with compact road gearing. A gravel chain ring accommodates an 8.3% gradient. A 40 tooth cassette goes further to allow an 8.6% gradient and combining both the gravel chain ring and the large cassette allows 9.8% gradients to be traversed within target riding conditions. We can look at a few climbs and estimate the impact of gearing on this imaginary rider. Using veloviewer.com, we can see a breakdown of Strava segment climbing gradients. This memorable 2.2 kilometer, 205 meter elevation gain climb from my 2015 flesh ride averages 8.4% incline. About half the distance climbing is over a 9% gradient with some steep pinches of 20 to 25% gracing the top of the climb. Of course, target limits must be broken here, but by how much? A 20% gradient requires our rider to push 510 watts with compact road gearing, 430 watts with a large cassette, or 380 watts with a gravel crank and large cassette at 70 RPM. Low gearing saves a massive spike in intensity on such a steep section, but the steepest parts might still be best walked. If climbs like this are common in your brevet courses, major efforts to achieve low gearing will be useful. Next, here is Namhan Sansong, a popular climb in Seoul and an inclusion on many brevet courses around Seoul. The gradient tops out at 11% when going east. Equipping a gravel crank set and large cassette allowed this to be climbed while barely ever going over desired limits. By comparison, compact road gearing requires 290 watts on the steep bits, which is roughly this imaginary rider's FTP. This doesn't ruin a ride, but it does incur a debt as mentioned before. If climbs like this are the steepest experienced on your brevet courses, gearing lower than a 1 to 1 ratio will still be appreciated. This imaginary rider and the example climbs in my region apply to me. But what about you? How can you assess your gearing needs? Well, first, you need data on your local or target brevet courses. Randonneuring clubs usually have a wide range of yearly courses and permanent courses available on their websites. Get familiar with course characteristics by skimming over their metrics. How many notable climbs are there? How long and steep are these climbs usually? How many meters of climbing per 100 kilometers do courses usually have? The greater each of these measures, the more likely you are to prefer lower and lower gearing. Notable climbs will almost always have associated Strava segments. Step two is to use veloviewer.com to upload a sample of climbing segments from your courses. How much climbing can be expected above 7%, 8%, 12%, 15%? Hover over the gradient bar chart on the website to see these exact distances. After analyzing your sample of climbs, determine a target gradient that you want to be able to climb within your limits. Next, you need to assess or estimate your BTP, brevet threshold power, and target climbing power. This requires a power meter and lots of real world experimentation on long rides ridden at mostly steady states. Target specific powers for long rides pace climbs modestly, and note your feelings and perceived effort over the rides. Adjust your efforts in future similar rides to hone in on the range where your ideal BTP and climbing power exist. Note signs of heart rate drift and low power production towards the end of these rides, which point to target power being a bit too high or problems with fueling or hydration. Also note needed recovery or suffering performance after climbs to adjust your target climbing power. Now you can input your target gradient, your rider weight, bike weight, target climbing power, and other reasonable variables into the Gribble calculator. This will output the slowest speed you want to be able to cycle within your lower cadence limit. 
and help you determine your gearing needs. Taking this low speed, we can use bikecalc.com and their speed at cadence function to input your preferred cadence range, your tire sides, and a wide range of low gearing possibilities. Things like different cog sizes and different chain ring sizes. Explore these different combinations to match your lowest comfortable cadence with your slowest climbing speed. From this, you can see what changes in drivetrain you should consider. Is your result a surprise? Unless you live in Florida, you probably found the gearing you need is lower than what you have. You might look over at your bike and wonder how the heck you can get that gearing without swapping out every piece of drivetrain for something new. Navigating compatibility can seem challenging at first. Having hacked drivetrains for years, I can share some tips to get extra low gearing with road shifters. Of course, a gravel crank set is an easy step one. It can be done without swapping the front derailleur if you have a clamp band derailleur, or if you use a super compact adapter. The rear is where it gets complicated. Starting with general workarounds, Wolftooth goat links are the standard hack for lower gearing for a reason. By dropping the derailleur mount lower, regular derailleurs can shift to a larger cassette cog than they were designed for. These larger cassettes increase the need for chain wrap, so long cage versions of derailleurs are best when using a goat link. A similar but smaller effect can be had with B-screw adjustments, allowing most derailleurs to exceed manufacturer specifications. Some reports show a derailleur that's rated to 34 tooth maximum cog size can actually shift to a 40 and sometimes 42 tooth cog just with a B-screw adjustment. Aside from those general workarounds, a mere two tooth max cog size advantage can be gained with a GRX 400 rear derailleur for 11 speed and newer 10 speed Shimano mechanical road shifting systems. The SRAM 11 speed 1136 cassettes keep the derailleur in spec, but the GRX 400 is more enticing for a B-screw adjustment and exceeding Shimano recommendations. Hey there, high roller. I can tell you're just like me. You like the finer things in life. I can tell that by your electronic drivetrain. And you know what? If you want lower gearing, you can just add any mountain bike stuff that you want. That's the benefit that we pay for. Anything you want, the best in life. So go ahead, add that dinner plate to the back. You can climb anything. Just make sure you don't get too big of jumps between gears. That's not the best that life has to offer, so why would you do that? For 10 and 11 speed SRAM mechanical systems, 10 speed SRAM mountain bike rear derailleurs work with both the 10 and 11 speed road shifters. The 47 tooth chain wrap on a long cage version of this derailleur makes them a great candidate for a B-screw adjustment or goat link to get really low gears. Yeah, it's wool. I like everything wool, even my chamois. Ah, hey there. Eight or nine speed drivetrain, huh? Good choice. Anything above that is just the money men trying to get the money out of you. It's not going to help you go any faster. One thing you want to think about, though, is the crank. You're probably going to want a triple. That way you get the wide gear range you need, and you can keep some small jumps each time you change gears. I recommend mountain bike stuff. Do you know the road shifters for your eight and nine speed drivetrains can shift the mountain bike stuff from that brand? It's great. Over there, I got a 42, 33, 24. That thing can climb up a wall. Now, if you hang around here for a little bit, I'll tell you about cantilever brakes and I can share my favorite wax recipe with you too. Hey, where, where are you going? Hey, come back. So now we know that lower gearing is important to manage efforts on climbs, determined your personal gearing needs, and figured out how to cobble a suitable system of gearing together. If you found this useful, please share a like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps a lot. This equipment and the mindset behind it will help you succeed where others fail and not blow up on climbs. Even with the best equipment and careful planning, there are still going to be times where it just isn't enough. When that time comes, don't worry. Walking is just another gear. 
and there is no shame in that.